The parenting landscape has shifted dramatically over the last two generations. In the 1950s, parents enjoyed the support of their own parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, extended family. One parent, typically the mother, was at home with the children. Today, in many homes with two parents, both of them have to work because of the current financial realities. There are more single women heading the households. Older children are raising their siblings. There is much less support, much less community involvement in parenting, even as the population continues to grow at a rapid rate. I haven't had my mom there helping me, and she wasn't there by my side, but actually people were there that were there by my side, so it just hurt me to say that they are here, they're always there for me, and my mom, who is my mom, is not there for me. I had to, to you know, say that, you know what, this, this is for my picnic. This is for my daughter. None of them know I'm here. They don't know why I'm here, right? And I stick to this. It's just, I think a little bit scarier time to be raising kids without manuals and supports and friends and support groups. We begin with the premise that all parents need, need support. So we use the concept parenting support rather than parenting education. We notice what is their major problem is, how do I deal with my child when it's only me? I'm the only parent around, the other parent might not be there. How do I share my time between the work that I have to do to provide for the child and the nurturing that I have to do so that the child gets that positive parenting needed. I was 15 when I knew I was pregnant. Then, then time I never had my mom, I never have nobody, I never have like, except with one home then. And this person just gave me home, shelter, food, and what I needed it. So that makes me feel like I'm, I'm free and you deserve to. How to be a parent was right at YES. They teach us how to breastfeed the child, how to take care of them, when to feed them, how many times to feed them, how to change their diapers. They teach us so many things that sometimes it just runs through your mind over and over and over, but the, the doctors there come like, you need to give them their vaccination, make sure you're on time, make sure you feed them, you burp them. Everything what you have to do with them, they usually, they are there telling you what to do. Now I go out and tell young people my story and when we're done, they just come back and say, Jennifer did a good job, I don't have that strength to do it. And it just makes me stronger because young people are going through the same thing, but they can't do it. But if I do it more and more, people will come and join me and we'll make a big group soon. <laughs> Through my life where I got it, my ma, actually, I really don't want to give my daughter that because that feel like, in a, my world, my parents feel like I don't know nobody. And, I know why my daughter feel the same way. I want she feel that like she have people where she could depend upon. If they're not me, granny, grandpa, but she have people where I depend upon. And I just want to give her the best that I didn't have and give her the love that I didn't have. We're at a critical crossroad um, with our parents um, because parents are struggling with a lot of issues that they have to be balancing, um, issues relating to poverty. Um, the spate of violence that's going on in our country. A lot of parents simply um, don't have the tools, don't know what to do and, and how to do it in raising um, their children. The child's brain, and I know you've heard this much more than once, but the child's brain is actually like a sponge at that time. It sucks up everything. So if the child goes through traumatizing events, that will affect the child later on in his behavior. Then when the child is six, seven, you wonder, why is my child behaving that badly? It's because of what happened when the child was younger. So you have to look at what is happening, birth the three. I believe that Belize then as a country has started to focus on the issue of what will make strong individuals in our society. One of those issues is the early childhood development policy. It's looking at 
What are the investments made in the child from an early age in the area of health, in the area of human development and in the area of education? If parents and all those who work with children can understand that at the very beginning the child's brain is developing, then they will create programs and they will do activities that will nurture that child. So early childhood development looks at the key critical components that makes a child grow. I think one of the great contributions that UNICEF can make to this debate and this discussion as we search for answers to, you know, what makes good parents and, and parenting is just to look a little more, probe a little deeper into this whole situation of absentee fathers. Nobody has really stopped to examine why is it that there are so many fathers absent from their children's life. We, we really don't know do those fathers really want to be a part of their children's life. What are the factors that are driving this? Um, it would be important to examine that because in order for us to understand how do we build a response that tries to bring fathers back into their children's life, we need to know why they're not there in the first place. Ready? When I go and pick my daughter up, and she says, my daddy come, it's just like heaven, like yeah, right? She's running, I'm running. So it's, it's, it's really uplifting, it lightens my spirit. My daughter's three and a half years old. Her mother and I were in a relationship, but we're not together anymore. We live in separate cities about an hour and a half away from each other. My daughter spends every other weekend with me. We had to go to court to, um, to figure out, to define how we would, you know, share parenting. I don't want to say it's, it's, it's a women's court system, but that's how I felt when I went to the family court, no? It is not man-friendly. Uh, you walk up there and you, you get the stairs already, people watch like, hmm, we did up here, most maintenance or no one take care of picnic. The services for parenting for men we need more counseling in, in teaching us how to cope with the situation, cope with, with, with yeah. having patience. Yeah. Uh, I think that, that a lot of times the problems coming from the baby mama like, gets extremely taxing. And a lot of guys, many, many men would, would rather walk away and have to deal with that situation. And although they might want to take care of their child, want to take care of their child. Um, that chases them away, like, like the baby mother just chase them away, so to speak. We like saying about this, you have to man up. Well, then exactly the case, you have to man up and, and recognize that that child not really come into this world because they want to. You put that child here. And so it's your responsibility to man up and take care of your picnic. And that not just means, you know, just financial stuff. You have to be a part, I personally feel you have to be a part of your child's life. We create this society. It didn't just happen that, that men are like this and women are like this. We created it and we foster it and we perpetuate it in how we raise our sons and how we raise our daughters. Something that we, we, we t also tend to do is to um, make the assumption that um, parents can um, make that the transition between the different stages of a child's life. So you've got, um, you know, a baby, toddler, and um, adolescent. Uh, we, we, we assume that parents are equipped with that, that know-how as well. And um, certainly our parents need a lot of support in the transition years um, because of the, the added complexities um, that our environment provides now for our children. When a child is younger, the mother or the father is, you know, what they look up to. You know, my mommy says or my daddy says. When they start going to school, it's the teacher. But still the parents have a great hole in terms of how the level of influence they have on the kids. But when they become adolescents, it's a wide range of influences. That is why the emphasis so strongly on parent support. We need to ensure that our parents and, and communities are part of um, the planning, designing, 
implementation, that they're the ones that advocate at the end of the day for, for programs. And certainly by that, they're the ones that will build more social demand. And without that type of um, base and at the grassroots level, it's often very difficult to, to keep parents feeling engaged. I want parents to know you'll make mistakes, you'll not get it right, but it's about just continually trying to build that relationship with your children because that's what it is at the end of the day, you know, that connectedness and just consistently trying and just trying to understand, you know, and I think that's one of the messages because we, you know, sometimes we try to say, oh, it's perfect and you know, you must get it this way because, you know, this is what parenting is about and it's not true. And so we want to come from that approach with parents to say that, may we recognize that every single one of us, whether you're from whatever class of life right now, is dealing with a lot of issues and that we all need that little extra help and we want you to also teach us and to communicate to us what you need. To join the discussion on parenting in Belize, visit Community and Parent Empowerment Program, COMPAR, Department of Human Services at number 40 Regent Street in Belize City. For further information, visit unicef.org backslash Belize or dbzchild.org. This message is brought to you by UNICEF in partnership with the Ministry of Human Development, Social Transformation, and Poverty Alleviation.